is from a sword, known sword injury. The other is from a trepanation. All right? The one on the left is from a sword injury. This one's from a trepanation. So this is the idea. What if it was just a wound occurred in battle um, and not some sort of deliberate surgical procedure? And then congenital. Here's a reconstructed CAT scan of a condition called enlarged parietal frame, which can occur. Uh, how do we know that this skull that was found and described as evidence of trepanation in Iran is not just this enlarged parietal frame? So a little bit of this goes into that technique. And when we look at the skulls, we can sort of tell the difference between something that occurred just because of uh, one of these other processes or a deliberate hole in the skull that was made. Four different types of techniques, scraping, grooving, cutting, and drilling, and I'll go over all these different techniques. So scraping is by far the most common. It occurred in Peru, occurred in Europe, occurred in China, Hungary. Um, as we move into the later Greek, uh, early Egyptian and later Greek cultures, they used a little bit more drilling, but essentially the early, early cultures were all using the scraping technique. This is an example of what's called obsidian, which is volcanic glass very sharp, and this is what was thought to have used to perform these uh, procedures. And the idea is that the bone is just scraped constantly, you just scrape it over and over again until you develop a hole in the skull. Now, when Paul Broca was actually examining those skulls initially, one of the reasons he thought that children were probably operated on is because he actually tried this. He took cadaveric skulls of infants and skulls of adults and used a piece of glass and tried to scrape. And he found that he could get through an infant skull in about four minutes. But it took him almost 50 minutes to get through an adult skull. And so he sort of thought this technique was probably just done on children just for that reason. Although we know now that that not, that not to be true. Grooving is difficult to differentiate from scraping, but it's the idea of just grooving a small trough in a circular fashion and taking out a piece of bone. This was probably used when they were trying to obtain these amulets or rondelles of bone especially you know, for these ritualistic purposes. Cutting is another uh, technique that's seen, and really this is just found in South America and Mesoamerica and Mexico and Central America. This idea was using a knife like this called a tumi blade. Um, what this is is the surgeon would actually hold the patient with the head in between the knees, make the incision, and then gradually move back and forth with this tumi blade until he created different cuts in the skull and was then able to take out this piece of bone. These blades actually get a little thicker up near the top and the thought behind this is that it would be thick so that it wouldn't penetrate through the dura, that it would give you some sort of stopping point. This symbol actually of the Tumi knife was accepted as the Peruvian Academy of Surgery's symbol. So they have a Tumi blade as their symbol. Here's just some other examples of this uh, cutting trepanation where different cuts are made and uh, that middle piece of bone is removed. Other examples of Tumi knives that have been found. The drilling technique was relatively uncommon and in the very ancient world it was really only seen in, again, this uh, Mesoamerica in Mexico. You can see here there are two very circular holes and then sort of a uh, different type of hole in the middle. These holes, when measured, are exactly the same size. And so the idea is they think they use some sort of tubular drill to drill these holes and then break away the middle. And you can see there's a thin rim of bone here. And uh, as we look at <coughs> this in more detail, we find that there is some regrowth of bone in this area. Here's another example of drilling. Another technique of drilling is using this thing called the terebro, which is to make these small holes and the idea being that you make these small holes as sort of perforations and then take out that middle piece. So anesthesia techniques, although were brought into the modern time uh, fairly recently, were known in ancient uh, times. One of the thoughts is that typically these trauma patients were unconscious to begin with, so you really didn't need any anesthesia. Uh, another thing they used was alcohol, although I have read some reports that suggest that it was the doctors and the surgeons that used alcohol more than the patients did. The coca plant uh, was used by Incans to give some form of anesthesia, and opium was known to the Egyptians, which would again use some sort of anesthesia. Now antisepsis as a theory wasn't really known in ancient times, but through observation they were able to tell that certain patients got what they knew to be infections. 
And when they applied different ointments and different herbs to the wounds, these patients wouldn't get infection. So the Incas used uh, different kinds of plant extracts. Hippocrates, I told you that every wound would get this cataplasm for 24 hours. And what cataplasm is, is a uh, mixture of boiled vinegar and flour. And the thought here is that this would prevent infection in some way. Uh, and Albacusis uh, applied alcohol from wine to the wounds and thought that this would uh, sterilize the wounds. And then there is some evidence of cranioplasty. This skull that I showed before, this piece of bone that came from this skull was actually found in place in this skull. And so there's some thought that it would actually cover up these holes after they made them. There are some that are actually found with coconut bark or some other form of cranioplasty in place. So how did these patients do afterwards? You can imagine that the idea of drilling into somebody's head with no surgery, you know, no operating room, no anesthesia, no sterile technique, the patients wouldn't do that well. Actually, it turns out to be the opposite. So based on looking at these skulls, we can see that, for example, here, the diploic space, which is open here, is closed here. So there's been some healing over of this. And we can see little pieces of bone that are starting to form here to indicate that there has been some healing as opposed to this area where there's no new bone form. Evidence of infection. So here is evidence of osteomyelitis. And obviously, if there was an infection, the patient must have lived. And so a study was actually done by John Verano, um, who looked at 109 different skulls and tried to categorize what was the healing rate. And they actually found that over 80% of the skulls showed some healing most with long-term healing based on these results. In addition, he looked at different areas of the skull to see which were healing better and found that those over musculature didn't do as well. So perimortem death means they died around the time of the procedure. The idea here being that either uh, the injury itself caused trauma to, for example, the temporal area and the middle meningeal artery, and those patients might not have done as well, or the surgeon themselves could have caused some sort of trauma in these areas that are covered by muscle, which generally refer to the temporal areas. And in looking at this, and looking at evidence of osteomyelitis, found that the infection rate was only about 4.5%. So remarkably well for primitive societies. And then overall survival, they actually looked at different time periods. So this is the late intermediate period, the early Incan period, and the late horizon period in this area of Cuzco, Peru, and found that over time, people lived longer. And so there must be some learning curve to this technique. So basically, we found that cranial neurosurgery has been practiced in some form for over 10,000 years. Um, why exactly it was performed there does seem to be a preponderance of evidence that this was done for some sort of therapeutic reason for the most part. That people were either getting trauma treated or they had some other abnormality that was getting treated. Although we do know that there is some evidence of treatment of seizures which is sort of falls into that magico-therapeutic range. Different techniques and again a surprisingly high survival rate with the low infection. So in any case I hope that was somewhat interesting. And uh, it took you a little bit away from medicine, but I thank everyone for their attention. And if there are any questions.